So uh, there's two good outcomes in exit strategies and two bad outcomes in exit strategies. The two good outcomes in exit strategies are either you go public or you get acquired. The two bad outcomes in exit strategies are you either shut down or nothing happens and you just kind of around and you're there for five years and you're there for 10 years and you're there for 20 years and you're just kind of hanging out and there's no actual transaction, there's no actual exit, which happens to a lot of companies. They're just, they're just there. That's not necessarily a bad thing, I should actually add, because there are numerous companies that are, don't have the capability to go public. They don't necessarily have an interest in being acquired, but they're throwing off enough cash that to just hang around and get $5 million a year in kind of dividends every year is a beautiful thing. So it's only not a beautiful thing if it's kind of a break-even business and it's not driving any meaningful dollars to the entrepreneur over time. Um, but really, the two avenues are either you go public or you, or you, or you get acquired. So I'm going to talk about um, kind of the four experiences that I've had, um, some having been acquired, some having gone public, et cetera, uh, and the processes around that. And I would, I've probably have met with over 200 to 300 different companies about um, acquiring the company. Um, and I've met with a couple dozen companies about being acquired. So kind of d did this game a lot. <laughs> um, so it'll be tough to sum up in 15 minutes. But the first thing that I just want to say is um, entrepreneurs. <laughs> um, entrepreneurs sacrifice so much. They sacrifice their time, they sacrifice their family, they sacrifice um, immediate income. And the reason typically why an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur is not for the money. I've met hundreds of entrepreneurs. It's because they feel passionate about wanting to create a product and run a business that they care about. But in the back of every single entrepreneur's mind, it's not the primary reason. It's there is a path towards me being able to do X, whether X is retiring early, whether X is supporting my, their families, whatever X happens to be. I have never met an entrepreneur that, at least as a secondary or tertiary priority, there's not a, a, a dollar benefit to all the work that they've been putting into, it, into things. 100 Flowers. 100 Flowers started off with one store called Floral Plenty in the 1970s by a guy named Jim McCann. And it then acquired 30 stores, it then acquired the 100 Flowers name from someone else, actually. It didn't, it didn't start with that, that name. It started with Floral Plenty. And now it's a billion dollar revenue, 1.2, 1.3 billion dollar publicly traded enterprise. Um, the exit strategy for 100 Flowers was going public. It went public in 1999, um, three months prior to the NASDAQ peak. Had they waited probably five or six months, they may not have gone public for a few years. They likely would not have gone public for a few years. The reasons why, when I was at One Inch Flowers, I ran M&A, and I talked to probably two, 300 companies about acquiring those companies. And I would say there's three reasons why companies were interested in being acquired, okay? And they fall into these three buckets. The first is they genuinely believe that the acquirer can help their baby, their company, to grow faster. So in One Inch Flowers' case, um, we acquired a cookie business called Cheryl & Co., Cheryl's Cookies. You know it? Oh, absolutely. Great. Yeah. Based in Columbus, Ohio, delicious cookies. Mm -hmm. and, and the founder said, wow, we're doing X million dollars in sales right now, you know, between 10 and 100 million dollars, let's say. You guys are doing 500, 600 million dollars in sales. You could unleash your customers to buy Cheryl & Co. Oh my God, you'll be able to build my brand, you'll be able to build our cookies, you'll be able to invest more in our factory. God, that's exciting. And for many entrepreneurs, the reason why they want to sell their company is because they love their baby and they know that the time for it to grow is under someone else's ownership where there's all these great things that can be leveraged as part of that growth. Okay, so That's the first reason. The second is, frankly, that um, entrepreneurs are the, the, the most uh, 
risk, they're, they're, they have the, the most risk out there of any type of individual who's working in business. Because 100% of their wealth is tied up in the future success of this one company. And that's scary as all hell. Because the company thrives, they could do great. The company fails, they're worth zero. And the 10 or 20 years worth of work that they put into it is gone. So entrepreneurs will oftentimes exit because they just need to take money off the table. They, they, they might want to sell a portion of the business and then invest it in the S&P 500 or, or just, you know, if, if another crash happens and the company just goes down, then they'll be killing themselves for the fact that they didn't take some money off the table prior to it. So taking money off the table is another priority for an entrepreneur in terms of exiting a business. And the third, and I unfortunately do see this quite often, is just mental exhaustion. Just mental and physical exhaustion of, I've been doing this for five years, I've been doing this for 10 years, I just can't do this anymore. I, I just, I, I, th th it's, it's tough. It's hard to be an entrepreneur. And some people are made for it and some people aren't. Um, but even people that are made for it, to be able to have that type of intensity and entrepreneurship is great because it's so intense and you're creating your destiny and you're creating your future, but at the same time, it's intense. And every day is, is, is hard working and some people just can't handle it anymore. Um, so One Inch of Flowers, when we acquire companies, those are the three primary reasons why those companies exited. Let's talk about everyday health. Everyday health. So everyday health, um, between 200 and $250 million in sales, all in a 10 year time period of going from zero to 200, $250 million in sales. Um, the company actually filed an S-1, which is what one needs to file to go public. Um, hired a number of bankers, this is all public information, hired a number of bankers to, um, to help in the process of getting the financials in order, um, finding suitors. After going through that whole process, they spent a year going through the process, and they pulled the entire thing back. Millions of dollars spent, but they decided that it wasn't the right timing for them to go public because the size of the company, frankly, wasn't big enough. To be a publicly traded media company, <laughs> there's no right number. I mean, the street, frankly, is public and it sells 50 or $60 million. It shouldn't necessarily be public, but to be a public traded media company, you need to be in the 200, 300 million dollar type, type revenue business or else there's just frankly too much risk. Two, three years later, they then refiled an S1 and the company um, proceeded with going public. Um, and they went public at about $14. The stock today is at about $10, roughly a year, year and a half after going public. I thought it'd be interesting to just talk about some of the differences in having been an employee when the company was private than when the company was public. Because Make no mistake about it, um, being public heavily influences the executive decisions, the board decisions of a company. So I'll talk about three or four different areas. So historically, without going into everyday health specifically, historically and typically, when you're public, you're focused on the quarter. And you have to hit that number. You have to hit that quarterly <coughs> number. You have to beat that quarterly number. When you have to hit a quarterly number and quarterly number and quarterly number, the ability to significantly invest dollars in the business, in the P&L, that's gonna take profit down, that's gonna lower your EPS, is a hell of a lot more difficult, and this is obvious, but when you're living it, it's unbelievable, than when you're a private company, and you don't necessarily have to hit the street expectations for a number, which means that at the end of every quarter, it's going to be, how am I making sure to gap every single dollar that we can within this quarter? It's making sure that any investments that one's going to make is going to have a shorter time frame in terms of payback. Many companies make the mistake by going public too quickly because it doesn't allow them to invest appropriately in the business's growth. I see it, you see it all the time. Um, and kind of that's one big difference. The second is there's just a lot of administrative costs of being a public company. With Sarbanes Oxley, um, with, with financial disclosures that are required, um, with the need for an investor relations person on staff, 
with the need for higher levels of accounting um, uh, that are required, whether from, from a big accounting firm. Um, that, that actually has a million, two million dollar like cost attached with the amount of legal fees that one needs to pay, whether to file, which is a one-time thing, which is not a big deal, but the ongoing legal costs of continuing to be a public company, disclosures that are required, there's true administrative costs that actually take down profit and true transaction costs of being a public company. Um, and we definitely felt it because, you know, we saw it. Next is because short-term orientation is so important and because it's very difficult to invest in one's P&L, meaning spending dollars, operating expenses, the growth avenue tends to shift quite dramatically from internal investment to M&A, to acquiring companies. And you'll see many, many public companies, frankly, one of the reasons why they become public in the first place is because they get access to more cash when they're public. And that cash is an avenue for M&A. And then when you spend $20 million on M&A, you're acquiring a whole bunch of revenue and a whole bunch of profit that then makes it easier for you to demonstrate growth in the short term, for you to hit your quarterly numbers. There are public companies out there that frankly make it a habit two, three times a year before each quarter, they're doing some acquisition, and then when they disclose their numbers, they sometimes do not disclose what the numbers were pre and post, and they disclose the total numbers. They say, oh, look at how much I grew. We just grew 15%. Yeah, but you acquired a company that was growing at 20%. You actually lost 5%, but no one knows that. Instead, when the analyst calls happen, they'll say, it was a, it was a meaningful you know, percentage of our, of, of our growth. But was it over 100% of your growth? <laughs> they don't say that. Um, so definitely much more M&A after being a, uh, a public company. And the FLAS is actually things much higher level of stress. Um, employee, uh, when you have, when you have a, 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 a box score every single day, which is your strike price, which is your, your, your company's stock price, and you know what your strike price was because you came in, you had options, and you're underwater, and, and you came in, it's worth $12. You worked really, really hard to get there. Well, when you're in the earlier stages of the company, that's, it's motivating to have these options because you don't know what they're worth, right? And sometimes the human psyche is more motivated by not having information because it could be worth $100 if it's at $12. You don't know what it's worth. But once you actually know what it's worth, that motivation actually tends to decline. And, and there are hard, it's actually harder to motivate employees after going public, certainly when the stock is, is below what one's options are. But even if it's above, um, you have knowledge. And, and, and knowledge means you don't have the ability to dream quite as much. And that dream is a great source of employee motivation. Um, seeking Alpha, great company, as I mentioned. You don't want to be acquired when your growth rate is so high that you could demonstrate much higher levels of revenue, but at the same time, you also don't want to wait until you're more flattening out and that your revenue might be higher, but your, but your growth rate is lower. All in, it's actually much better to sell when you're in a high, steep growth rate than when you necessarily have high num high, a high degree of revenue because it's about the dream. It's about what the business can become. When you have high growth rate, even off of a lower revenue base, when you take that over five, 10 years, wow, look at what it turns into. When you have high revenue with a low growth rate, there's no dream. It's not that exciting. Well, can that, what can that company be? Um, so companies that know they're in a path towards not being acquired need to make sure that they sell at a time of very fast revenue growth rate because that's where the multiples are going to be highest. For Investopedia, it's a totally different story in that Investopedia is owned by IAC. They mentioned we own a 30, 40, 50 different amazing brands. IAC has brought eight companies in its history public. Expedia, TripAdvisor, they all used to be home shopping. They used to be part of IAC. And then IAC essentially spins them off and they become public companies. IAC has done that actually seven times. The eighth time that it's about to do that is another month or two. They just announced there's going to be an IPO, as, as you may have read, about Match, Tinder, OkCupid, OK, OK the dating sites. Um, and all those will be having an IPO. Um, and so a path. So hopefully that's helpful and just talking about kind of a very wide variety 
of, of different uh, experiences from both sides of the table.